and gentlemen, everyone around it in between. It is Debate Saints and Seated Edition. We talk about things relevant to competitive cross examination debates. Um, I have with me from California State University, Long Beach, Devin Cooper. Thank you, Devin, for being here. Thank you for having me. All right. Okay, so this episode, uh, the, the concept was to go over key authors that come up in. Uh, debates on this season's topic, the the nuclear topic. And so, um, you know, beforehand, we just kind of brainstormed and put them together and we're going to go one by one through them. And it was what I liked about it was that my, my preconceptions about how the evidence might come down on this topic were that there, you'd have more authors on affirmative versus negative. But Devin, you were telling me that there's a whole lot of crossover that we're going to see today. Yeah, there is crossover because, you know, there's people that have like critical abs. There are people that have leftist, really like soft abs that are like mm -hmm. still based in the plan text. Right. And so the other thing, too, is that there is um, a lot of preemptions that are made by some people that use these authors because they were like, hey, even your own author said you should like engage in like nuclear policy, like that type <laughs> of stuff. So okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 That's interesting. That that sort of it gets on that level of the the, the evidentiary sort of competition uh, in debate. It takes on a really different level <laughs> in that it's like you getting that localized in that sort of you know um, rudimentary. Wow. All right. Yeah. I mean, because that's okay. like one of the so, of this topic. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Like, no, I'm sorry. But it's like, that's one of the stresses <laughs> of this topic is that it can favor a lot more of the traditional teams because even the critical authors that are um, talking about nuclear politics, they're still coming at the end of the day saying we should disarm nuclear weapons or take some mm -hmm. type of critical stance on them. So that right. kind of helps. <laughs> All right. Let's take a look at some of the... Um, people that came up through the brainstorming, all right? So first, we have Nick Ritchie. Tell me a little bit about Nick Ritchie, or at least uh, uh, I can talk about who he is from his bio, but more like how does he position himself in many debates? Well, so like um, Nick Ritchie is definitely a person who's talking about the global politics surrounding disarmament and like the whole disarm kind of movement when it comes to nuclear weapons. And so what you will find him in debates are either he'll be located in probably like the solvency mechanism or impact oh. level of disarm F oh. um, or he could be seen on the negative as um, kind of like a link or kind of a thesis background impacty kind of statement for a nuclearism k to like okay. criticize how nuclear politics is oriented in the status quo so so um what do you know about what he says about solvency of disarm like how does that i mean do you you're not debating but does that do you still have a basic understanding of how he explains it well so the way he kind of explains this is like a shift in how we understand nuclear weapons and that okay. like global politics as it is situated is based off of this like hyper kind of high skilled game of like using nuclear weapons for deterrence mm. but like those understandings of deterrence and calculated ambiguity are things that kind of make global politics a little bit hegemonic mm. um and so uh trying to remove some nuclear weapons from the hegemonic order or just disarming in general would help try to lessen the imposition of how that happens. Um, now, he's writing in a very critical and kind of traditional way. And so I can see why a lot of tra traditional teams still utilize him on the affirmative or them on the affirmative. And then also on the negative, a lot of the K teams, because I know particularly our team uses that author a lot. Okay. Um, when it comes to their uh, racialized security, K. All right. So he is senior lecturer at University of New York, and it, that's his particular focus: nuclear disarmament, proliferation of arms. Okay. Well, you said that like it was how long ago that 
the topic was nuclear war, uh, no, nu not nuclear war, um, weapons of mass destruction? Um, 2009. 2009. Okay. Yeah. So he, yeah. Um, what's interesting, I wonder if he's m more of a, a recent addition to the literature pool because he got his joining New York in 2011. So I'm wondering uh, a lot of his publications. Yeah. I mean, he might have written something a little bit before that, but I, I don't remember him from that topic. Right. Like okay. Cool. So let's go on to Vincent Mtondi. Okay. What do we, Dr. Vincent Mtondi? Yes. Yeah, so this particular author is one that is talking about the black contribution and perspective of nuclear weapons and huh. he talks a lot about the history of how nuclear weapons um were protested by black intellectuals like um lorraine hansberry um langston hughes wb du bois right and he's talking about that tradition as being something that is embedded in like a lot of black scholarship and just in the black ethic of resistance and so he's saying is that he kind of like sides on the issue of like disarmament as well, but still mm -hmm. a criticism of saying that black voices need to be centered in that conversation because they've been excluded for since the inception of like things like, you know, Oppenheimer and all that good stuff. Um, right. So uh, a lot of the people that were writing in the Cold War era and during those particular times uh, they didn't, they were not as popularized as they would be now, right? And then he was also talking about like how the contributions of literary folks and how they were writing this into their stories, like Langston Hughes was writing into a story. He made a story about this person named Simple and like, <laughs> it's well, crazy. It because familiar, it, yeah. yeah, he's just talking about like how if a nuclear bomb was to go off, the bomb shelters would be segregated and so that mm. black people wouldn't even be able to get inside of them. But mm. what the fiction was about is that like, hey, if black people can survive Mississippi, they can survive a nuclear bomb. Right? Okay. It's just like kind of that and, and adding that kind of resistance to it and saying that we need to have black people at the seat of the table talking about nuclear politics. And so that's one of the people that like a lot of the black teams utilize to criticize it, but the problem is too is that this author can also be used on the negative to be like, I mean, on the affirmative to be like, hey, this is the reason why we should disarm because right. you know nuclear fallout would substantially affect a lot of black communities and things. That right, age. right, right, right. Um, see, I'm, I'm looking at his bio, and he makes uh, annual trips to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yes, Talk that's a big you. part of his um, yeah. his uh, his theorization because he also talks about like that instance as like one of the culminations of racialized violence of nuclear weapons is that like it was dropped on you know hiroshima and nagasaki but it wasn't dropped on like the other like european powers that we saw as like evil during that time or the axis of evil this is this is great like these two authors are like it, it seems like a very different approach to talking about nuclear weapons, but at the same time, all of their literature is so absolutely topical. You know what I mean? I'm like, of of course, it this, is. this it is. is yeah, it's yeah, right. It's great. It's <laughs> like I mean, the 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 book is yes, African Americans against the bomb. It's I'm like, of course that that that's yeah. You need to cut that and and put it into your debate, right? That's true. All right, let's. Here we go. Next one, Ana Agathenu. So, let me go. I was lucky enough to get her her LinkedIn profile up, so that's cool. Yeah, she is. She's deep. She has a harsh criticism of Western imperialism and hegemony, and deco and colonialism, right? And she's really questioning the foundations of like liberal democracy and, you know, how those things are structured. So she's definitely a big negative author. Oh, okay. <laughs> Real so, big. so it is it is one sided on the in that sense, huh? Yeah, you can't really read a United States federal government plan text with Anna Agathangelou. Like this is oh, not really. 
No, she's. So, I mean, and that's. I mean, that's not the only link, but that's the only link you need. Is that basically? Yeah, I mean, it's just like it's just like if uh, if an affirmative is utilizing, you know, military understandings of deterrence and like thinking about like uh, calculated ambiguity, all these different types of um, mechanisms of international relations. She is making a big criticism of it. She's also talking about like a lot of the gendered aspects mm-hmm. of international relations and how that being predominantly a projection of male power influence is something that definitely corrupts a lot of the global political economy of that stuff. Um, but yeah, she's she's deep. <laughs> yeah. Uh- her publications are deep. Just the number of them too is ridiculous. She's got like 98 publications and several of them are books. Um, my goodness. One the gender trauma resources, colonial and FSS. Uh, okay. Feminist IR, feminist IR studies. Okay. So it seems like, um, Man, you can you could probably cut an entire critique of just her publications, probably. Yes, you can. <laughs> yeah, I've been, I mean, I, there have been people that have been trying to get <clears throat> my students to really read her, and I've been trying to tell them to read her as well. Um, but you know, sometimes students like to go in their own direction and do their own stuff. But I think she's a powerful author that people have going to have a tough time answering a lot of her direct claims. So, does she have anything to say directly on the issue of nuclear weapons? Um, it's like it's 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 small ish. Yeah. Okay. But it's still like she's questioning the foundation and structure behind yeah how we utilize those as a means of deterrence, right? So she talks about it, right? But she's not like I'm a scholar that is focused on the nuclear politics. She's kind of incorporating those things into a lot of the um, temporality and violence of international relations when she's discussing it. Um, it sounds like you'd, you'd really have to scour her works for those examples. They probably exist, right? They probably oh, exist. But they exist a lot. Yeah. It's just that I don't think she like sits on like one article. She's like, I am talking about this particular, yeah. <laughs> you know. But I mean, okay. she's literally a criticism of the entire international field, international relations field, which is good. Mm. Okay. So our next is Chris J. Cuomo. Not not to be mistaken for journalist. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, <clears throat> this particular author is one that is very much so situated in uh, FMIR kind of as well, but just broader international relations. And Mm -hmm. so their criticism, I don't want to like, you know, assume their pronouns, but you know, they're like woman presenting. But um, this particular author is definitely talking about structural violence and how we understand war and that war is not something that is just an event it is an ongoing process that occurs and when we try to say that when we have an absence of war it is this understanding of a negative peace because that that understanding of peace that is situated in the the commonplace understanding of not being in the state of war overlooks a lot of the structural things that people of color and indigenous folks see as a war against them Mm -hmm. right and so i think that this author is also coupled along with an author named amalade which is a person that talks about like how nuclear war nuclear fallout has already been something that has occurred for indigenous folks or people of color it may not be a literal you know nuclear war but things like slavery, Jim Crow, um, boarding school movement, all these particular things have been nuclear weapons formed against certain people of color. And that's something that's made it so the world has already ended for a lot of folks. When we think about like nuclear war wiping out existence. Right, 
just and she uses the language of, of nuclear war in in some of her writings yes oh okay so chris that must Cuomo be good does, and Amalade definitely does as well um because chris Cuomo is saying like like you know a lot of us we try to think about like when there's not hostilities of like nuclear tensions we think that that's a good form of peace mm. but instead we not we're not looking at the foundations of how those nuclear weapons were created in the first place and what countries had to be mined and extracted from to create those things and where we even place nuclear waste in like mm -hmm. a lot of indigenous and african countries i mean indigenous reservations you know indigenous land pretty much and in like african countries and those places had to be mined for like the particular rare earth minerals to create nuclear weapons and warheads and things of that nature yeah, I see she's an affiliate faculty member of the Institute for African American Studies and the Institute for Native American Studies, um, as well as others. But like those were the most relevant to what you were just saying right there. So mm -hmm. it's amazing. Okay. Courses. So, uh, oh, and she's a philosophy. So, whereas, um, uh, Ana Akatenyu uh, was uh, politics interesting mm -hmm. it, it, like it's interesting the, the the overlap between those two or the um the similarities but it also seems uh, that those ones uh, those different bodies of publications um can form yeah i mean you can form your your own critique off of them but being paired with things that talk more about nuclear weapons directly would even sort of I don't know, it seems to sort of build that story a little bit more on this particular topic. Yeah, I mean, it builds the story more because it's kind of explaining the structure that has produced the logic behind how we're talking about nuclear weapons. Right, right. And um, so I think is, you know, it's still like very important because a lot of people like to go just to the nuclear weapons authors, <clears throat> but not think about the complementary scholarship that exists to help explain the uniqueness question of what's going on and why um nuclear weapons are the embodiment of whatever ism you want to talk about right okay excellent next one benjamin meaches so he's one of my favorites because he used to judge me in debate a lot <laughs> he's a debate person um, and so he talks a lot about psychoanalysis as well as um, racialized understandings of the bomb. Uh, and so I think we actually cut one of his cards, I mean, not cards, one of his articles about um, the nuclear, like nuclear politics and the racialization of it and mm -hmm. how it's used. And so I think he comes from a very like philosophical backing as well um that that is you know i definitely could say he's been in debate like for quite a bit of time that he's able to see how people discuss and how people oftentimes fetishize nuclear weapons and nuclear bombs and discussing them and that's right. kind of what he kind of brings to that conversation is the whole fetishization element of it and the desire of nuclear weapons and the racialized a bit of moral economy and all that good stuff Okay, so he's at the University of Washington Tacoma. Um, what has he got? Some does he have wait, any of his publications here? Or Henry Jackson School of International Studies? Interesting. Okay, not so much. Um, so where? What? How do you? Would you say that he falls on the spectrum more more af or neg, or is that? another one of them that can just well he could be a critical soft left f that kind of mm. explains some of the ontological stuff behind nuclear weapons but um i do think we use him on negative quite a bit oh okay as an author um because he writes really well and just it's like he's writing for debate arguments because he is a debater but oh yeah um, <laughs> yeah <laughs> But he's awesome. Um, and so I think that like affirmatives can use like many of these authors, but it depends on how you're willing to defend against framework 
because you got to be able to explain why uh, the team that is negative gets to have some type of ground in a debate when you're already criticizing the topic and resolution, which is something that you technically should be doing on the negative. Yeah, right. So, uh, you're right, right, right. The um, I, I think the the man, it becomes difficult when the with the cr critical AF and then you're like, all right, so where's my judgment coming down to, right? If both of them are having really good critical approaches to this topic, you're like, <laughs> well, yeah. a lot of it will come down to the framing of it and yeah. how impact calculus is happening. Um, because if you have a competing framework interpretations or competing um, roles of the ballot, then it comes down to that. But a lot of times people just kind of like say those things and they yeah. don't always go into nuance and try to explain why their framework produces a better form of education or a better form right. of resistance or whatever. And so that's kind of the problem when people are debating these types of apps is that they kind of just lose the permutation in a lot of ways. Mm. So. All right. We're on a good pace here. Let's take a look at this next one. Callum Lister Matheson. So he's also a former debate person and he does uh, me a lot. His stuff <laughs> is way deeper into the um <clears throat> the uh psychoanalytic trope here. Um, because his book, I think it's called um Desiring the Bomb, Psychoanalysis yeah. in the Atomic Age, right? Yeah. Um, and so he's really Diving into that kind of analysis and the constitutive lack, and you know, it's just like his stuff is really dense. I'm not gonna okay. lie, <laughs> um, and I mean, and I get it because he's like a genius, right? He he's a genius, um, but a lot of people have used this on the net on the affirmative um, to create a critical app. I remember one year someone used, I think it was Arizona State used this in 2009. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, yeah, I think it was around that time, I think. Or, or he could have had like some other articles that they were using that he was building up to the book, but I can't remember when his book was actually published. Does it say it there? Um, that Wait, uh, the, uh, in 2019. Oh, okay, so there was an earlier book that he okay. had that people were, or or a set of articles that people were using. And I think he's culminated this into the book and has expanded onto that logic with more recent examples of what's happening, which yeah. it's like, yeah. And talking about the okay. subjectivity of, you know, kill robots and nuclear weapons and yeah. So he's a former debater and then he wrote a book about nuclear weapons and it's- Yeah. <laughs> I it's mean, like a, lot of the, a lot of debaters spend a lot of time just talking about nuclear war and the prospect, yeah. of it, you know, and so wow. it's smart to make that kind of a direction that you will build a lot of your academic career around. Yeah. <laughs> and then, oh, man. So and then, like, and they're really good debate cards. Just really, yeah. really hard to understand. Just really hard. You got to have a really good advanced understanding of psychoanalysis. Um, from different avenues, <laughs> which I don't. <laughs> oh yeah, I oh. don't. No, um, you gotta. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes the strategy is not in your strong strongest area, but you, it's still the best strategy, you know. And mm -hmm. so sometimes the best card is the best card, um, and if it's even if it's not your your strongest suit, but yeah. I just th th looking at it, the last couple of examples of authors have been this sort of. Um, like feeding back into the 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 paper machine of debate, you know. What I mean, they they were using all the the paper, and now they're they're feeding papers into it so other people can use it. So it all comes full circle. All right. Speaking of paper mills, let's see this last one. Boom. Mm -hmm. Center for Strategic and International Studies. So this really isn't an author, but it is still an incredibly important sort of source of information for. Um, for uh, nuclear topics, but any sort of international relations topic in general. All right. Global politics writ large, yeah. they are producing knowledge as we speak about everything across the globe. Um, uh, and so this is a think tank. It's a, 
you know, it, it's bipartisan for the most part. Um, mm -hmm. They have a very particularized understanding of global politics where we will try to uh, make an analysis of postures, nuclear posture, war posture, invasions, what, it, what we would be calculating as good things to do, what's the costs and benefits of doing certain actions in the international context. Um, and I think they are pretty expert at it, right? And they turn out some, some very interesting in-depth articles that are definitely used in debate quite a bit, especially when it comes to things like relations with China and Russia, um, Middle Eastern relations, and especially mm -hmm. what's happening right now with, um, you know, Gaza and Israel. Um, yeah. The whole conflict, because that's going to make its way into debate, like at Harvard next week. Uh, it just has to. Because oh. right. it's just a thing. It's like, there's no way you can talk about like deterrence and nuclearism and like, you know, militarization without talking about this subject. I know right. there's really one team that I know definitely going to talk about it from Baylor, um, a kid that I coached. And, you know, it's a really important issue to him, as it should be, because he's like, you know, Palestinian descent. Uh -huh. um, but this particular institute is going to have their perspective on that particular topic. Right. Um, oh, and because I do see they have all these different programs. I was almost overwhelmed by it. I mean, they have dozens of different programs. I was going to focus on the project on nuclear issues, but then there's um, Middle East program. I'm assuming that would be where they would place their um, white papers if they're going to publish them. Uh, yeah, and so analysis. Oh wow, there, there's just a lot of information. Absolutely. Uh, well, now you've given me something to look at. How do yeah, you? Like, they, I mean, they they have a wealth of information on this particular topic, and they definitely will answer back a lot of the authors that we've been talking about. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, a lot of the authors are also trying to criticize what they're doing. Okay. Um, but they still is, have a robust response. Is there ever any interaction between authors from CSIS and some of the others that we went over? Like, like they're direct. I mean, not always. Um, but sometimes those authors will say something about this particular incident. Okay. Right. I mean, they will hint at like, you know, neoliberal structures that are codified by think tanks that produce knowledge to justify their existence, right? And they would talk about CSIS as well yeah. as neoliberal interjections into like international politics, which is making mm -hmm. it like more calculable for killing people of color around the globe, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I'm looking at, yeah. They they so they got a lot of stuff on the nuclear issues, but I'll but if I pull open something, I mean they're definitely gonna be talking about Russia a lot because I think Russia has now started to um, disengage with the CTBT, which is you know chem the test ban on you know yeah and and uh, I think they're starting to build or start the initial phases of building a power plant in an African country. Um, a nuclear power plant? Russia yeah. is? Really? Yeah, because Russia and China have a lot of ties with Africa at this point. Yes. Doing things that are very interesting. But yeah, so that like a lot of these, this topic is going to change so much during the year, especially with this Israeli-Palestinian conflict that has gotten worse. Right. So, yeah. Well, that is um, a shame that we're ending on on that note. But still, I really did enjoy talking about the the different authors and different approaches. And I like learning some of the. I really felt like I learned a thing or two. Thank you very much, Devin. Welcome. All right. Uh, next time uh, when we see you, we'll be talking about other topics. All right. See y'all then.